in that salvation by personal faithfulness. Look at number one. Number one is Rahab's conviction from perceived facts. We're looking at Joshua chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 9. In Joshua chapter 2, reading from verse 9, she said unto the men, I know that the Lord has give me you the land. I know they had not even come in to the land. They had not crossed over to Jericho. They had not gone around seven days for Jericho's walls to fall down. This is faith. I've heard what the Lord has done. I am convinced beyond any shadow of doubt that the Lord has given you the land. Uh, that's the faith he wants us to have. You hear about heaven, and you, you read about Jesus going to heaven and be received of the clouds. I know there is heaven. You, you know about the angels coming here on earth and getting a message from heaven unto people. So there's no shadow of doubt in your heart. Although you have not been there, although it has not happened, you have the facts. And because you have the facts that there is heaven, whatever the Lord has said, do this and do this, and yours will be a place in paradise, a place in heaven. You say, I know. Now, the people who are doubting and feeling, is this true? Can that be true? Can that happen? And we have said, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that your fear, your terror is falling upon us upon us everybody feared but only rahab took action on the basis of that that she feared and that all the inhabitants of the land fade because of you look at verse 10 in verse 10 it tells us for we have heard how the lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. And that's, that's a fact. It really happened. And we heard. You are coming from Egypt and you are coming over to Canaan. And we know that that Red Sea is in between us. And we have heard. We are thinking, how are you going to cross over? But now we saw, we heard of the miracle. We heard of the manifestation of the power of the Lord that got you through, through the Red Sea. We heard about it. And there's a personal faith now. And I believe that same God that got through got you through the Red Sea, he'll bring you into the land of Canaan. And he said, when ye came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the king, unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan. And then he says, Sihon and Og, from the Utter, uh, it says that she utterly destroyed. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, and as soon as we heard these, these things, it says, our hearts did dead, and our hearts did melt. And because of what they had, what she had had, and what they had together, there was no courage, there was no strength in any man because of you. For the Lord, your God, He is God in heaven. Look at a heathen, look at a pagan that had not had a systematic study of the Bible. Look at a pagan, a heathen that had not heard directly from uh, any prophet, any preacher, any teacher of the word. And yet, the little she had heard, she thought of that. The little she had heard, she believed that and said, we know there is this God, the God in heaven above and in the earth beneath. That is what gave her the conviction now you've read the same story 
you see what the Lord has done. How he brought them out from the land of Egypt and brought them into Canaan. You have had much more than this Rahab the harlot ever heard. You've seen the destruction of Jericho walls. You've seen the destruction of Goliath. You have seen the water out of the rock. And you have heard about all those things that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that he did. Have you thought about those things? Have you believed? Have you built your conviction on the basis of what Christ has done? That's what she did. She built a conviction on the basis of what she had heard. And she knew this is for a fact. Look at Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew chapter 13, here we have the problem of the religious people at the time of Christ. They too, they heard and they saw everything that Christ did and they heard his message. And they knew, except the righteousness shall exceed the righteousness that the outward righteousness external righteousness of the scribes and pharisees he shall in no wise be saved and he told them how to be saved receive repent ye and believe the gospel now all those people that heard the words of christ they didn't do exactly like rehab did they didn't build their conviction they didn't uh, make up make up their mind they were going to obey even though they had from christ directly look at matthew chapter 13 verse 14 and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says by hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive you see you don't perceive you hear you don't understand and you don't make any conclusion you don't have any conviction as to what you have heard we're told in verse 15 in verse 15 it says for this people's heart is waxed gross their hearts wax gross, and their eyes, are, their ears are dull of hearing, and uh, their eyes they have closed. Rahab did not close her eyes, she didn't block her ears, she wasn't dull of hearing, she meditated on what she heard, and as a result of that, she built up a conviction. But these people, at the time of Christ, they didn't think of what they had heard. They closed their hearts and they blocked their ears less at any time. They should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. All those Pharisees, they followed Jesus about. They asked questions. Jesus answered their questions. They had the word of life. They had the word of salvation. They had the word that could have saved any of them, that could have saved all of them. But they didn't think on what they heard. So they perished even after hearing from Christ directly here we are today we've heard about salvation we've heard about justification we've heard about the power of God to transform any heart every heart and every life have we thought about it have we accepted it have we built conviction on that have we have we said we know only Christ can save and because he is the only one who can save that conviction drives us to him and we call upon him and we are saved look at number two here number two we're looking at Rahab's confession with personal faith Rahab's confession with personal faith and there are many kinds of uh, confessions that people who confess 
but their heart is not in the confession. They do it by road. They did it last Sunday. They're going to do it next Sunday. They did it last week. They're going to do it next week again. Confession, confession, confession. I have seen. Hold on. Pharaoh said that too. Hold on. And uh, Saul said that too. I have sinned. And all these people that confess and confess, their hearts are not there. They're not thinking, all right, I'm confessing the sin because sin is ruinous. I'm confessing the sin because if I don't confess, I'll not be forgiven. I'm confessing with the purpose of forsaking the sin. If we don't do that, it's just a superficial surface confession. And if it doesn't have faith, doesn't have conviction, doesn't have a mind to turn, a mind to seek the Lord so that we don't perish, that's no, that's no acceptable confession. We're looking at, um, at uh, Joshua chapter 2, and we're looking at verse 9. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that your terror, your fear is falling upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land defeat because of you. And look at uh, uh, verse 12 there. In verse 12, it now says, now. Uh, she was going to ask them uh, that she will be spared. She was going to ask them uh, that because she had separated herself by conviction, by confession, she had separated herself from the people of the land. She said, now, therefore, I pray you, I plead what you swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness. Now, the kindness did not stand in isolation. Her works did not stand in isolation. The kindness was on the basis that she knew that Jericho, part of Canaan, will be destroyed. She needed mercy. She needed forgiveness. She needed conversion. She needed a change. Her faith was in the fact that God was going to give the land to the children of Israel. So the kindness was on the basis of that faith. And that's the faith that saves. It's the faith that produces the kindness. And that she will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token. Give me a true token. One, he believed in God. He believed there's a God in heaven. He believed that the God of heaven is also a God of judgment. And she wanted to escape the judgment. What do you believe about God? Do you believe God in heaven? Do you believe all his words are true? Do you believe his offer of salvation based on repentance is possible and is going to be fulfilled? Do you believe that God is a God of judgment and if you don't repent, you will perish? Do you believe the revelation of God about hell, that those who go to hellfire will be there forever and ever? If you believe that you'll take step, your conviction will be practical, your confession will be definite and thorough. And that's what we learned about this Rahab. She was not asking for mercy, that she will be spared from the judgment coming upon Canaan. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, it says, And that she will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and uh, deliver our lives 
from death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And the only way to be saved and delivered from that death is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're told in, in Romans chapter 10, reading from verse 9. In Romans chapter 10, we're reading from verse 9 that if thou personal is not family faith, this is not community faith, personal, that whatever others around you believe or they don't believe, whatever people around you accept or they do not accept, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart. You see, it's not just the regular mouse confession. It's not just the superficial mouse confession. It's not just the religious traditional confession. You confess what your mouth because actually you believe in your heart. And out of the death of your mouth, of the heart, your mouth is making the confession. The mouth must always be connected with the heart and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Amen. Amen. That's how the salvation comes. You confess with the intention that you are not going to continue in that sin. When all the sins, oh, you say, but how about Rahab? Because Rahab is referred to, even in the New Testament, as Rahab the harlot. True. But she was not continuing in the immorality, in the fleshly art of being a harlot. How do you know? Well, a number of reasons. Number one, Matthew the publican. The Lord called him. He led all those uh, uh, taxis and the tables and followed Christ. He was no more a publican. A change had come. But because that was the name he was known by, that's why they still called him Matthew the publican. No more um, tax collecting and no more evil, no more extortion in his life. Simon the leper. Simon was known as Simon the leper, but she did not remain as a, as a leper because if she was still a leper, she will not live within the community of the children of Israel. And Jesus Christ will not just go there to eat. If she was, if she was still a leper, Christ would have manifested his healing power to heal him. He didn't need healing because he had been healed, but he was still referred to as Simon the leper. Now, Rahab the harlot, she was not remaining in that trade of being a harlot. How do we know that? Apart from the examples I've given you, we know that because a harlot will not be allowed to live in the midst of Israel. And Harlot of a cast off, of a cast away, she repented, she was no more a Harlot. Not only that, eventually she got married in Israel. And a Harlot, if she came to Israel, to the nation of Israel, and continued in that in decent, abominable lifestyle. She would not be able to marry an Israelite indeed. And so she wasn't a harlot anymore, but that was the name she had been bearing, and they kept the name to show the grace of God that th this woman, even though she was a harlot, she had repented, but that God could even save her. Saved, changed, transformed, but the name had remained. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, it tells us, for with the heart man 
believers unto righteousness. We believe unto righteousness. We don't believe unto religion. We don't believe and remain in the past old life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Now, look at your life. Did you have a change? Did you have a transformation when you said, I believe, I believe? If there was no transformation, it was believe in the head. It was believe like an historical scene. It wasn't a belief that affected your heart when you believe from the depth of your heart. There'll be a transformation, there'll be a change because with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And let's look at number three here. Number three is Rahab's commitment in persevering faithfulness. Commitment in persevering faithfulness. In Joshua chapter 2, reading there from verse 17, and the, and the, the man said unto her, we will be blameless of this thine oath, which thou hast made us to swear. Verse 18. In verse 18, Behold, when we come unto the, unto the land, and thou shalt bind this line of scarlet. Now scarlet is red. It was a picture of the blood of the land that saved them, those children of Israel. And you bind this on uh, the window by which you brought us down. It says, and thy father, thy mother, and thy brethren, and all thy father's household, uh, if they come home unto thee, and remain with thee when we come, then you will not perish. Isn't that the same thing the Lord has given us? It says, those who endure unto the end, when he comes, he finds us in his household. He finds us in his family. He finds us still believing in the Lord. Not that I raised up my hand at the crusade. And after the crusade, you don't continue. If you don't continue, then you will still perish. I will not perish. You will continue in Jesus' name. Look at Acts chapter 13, verse 43. Acts chapter 13. We're reading from verse 43. It says, Now, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and uh, of a religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Continue in the grace that saved you, that will make you steadfast. Continue in the grace that brought you out, that will keep you in. And there is the responsibility of the believer that as you believe in the Lord, you continue in that same grace. Acts chapter 14, verse 22. In Acts chapter 14, verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them, admonishing them, teaching them that they should to continue in the faith. We continue 
in the grace will continue in the faith by grace are you saved through faith that same grace continue through faith that same faith continue and that's the reason why every day we're following the lord temptations will come trials will come the lost of the world will try to invite us and suck us into the system of the world but we we'll remember only those who endure till the end only those who continue unto the end will be saved we're coming to uh, point number two now point number two escaping condemnation for past corruption through recognized faith we understand rehab the harlot she was into corruption she was into defilement she was into filthiness and she was into besetting sin but now claiming to confess to have conviction and to be converted we now need to understand why she could escape the condemnation and the same thing with you if you're going to escape the condemnation that will come to the sinners who die in their sin there must be the evidence you confessed with conviction there must be the evidence that you believed on the lord to conversion and that you remain and abide in that new life that belongs to the people of god there are three things we're looking at here number one we're looking at repentant harlots saved and justified by faith number two recognize humans separated Justified uh, by justification from filthiness. Then number three is reprobate hypocrites will suffer judgment for their falsehood. Look at number one. Number one, repentant hallows, saved and justified by faith. Not those who remain in their abomination, but those who repent, those who turn, those who clear away completely from the lifestyle of the hallowed, repentant hallowed, sage and justified by faith. We're looking at Matthew chapter 21, reading from verse 31. Matthew chapter 21 verse 31 whether of them twain the Lord, the Lord Jesus had told the parable of the father talking to one child go and do this he said I go sir he did not go he came to the second one I will not go but let her change his mind and wait and the Lord was now asking which of these two did the will of his father. They say unto him the first. Jesus says unto them, Verily, very, verily, I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Uh, to start which we uh, need to acknowledge the boldness of Christ, the courage of Christ, for him to tell religious people, for him to tell religious Pharisees and Sadducees, and to say the harlots and the publicans go into the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God before you uh, that will look like an abominable scene for them because they looked at the harlots at the worst 
of all human beings and now those hallows had opportunity to repent and to come out of their abomination and they did and the publicans stood like Matthew and like all the other publicans that Matthew invited to his house they also repented and Jesus said you religious Pharisees making sacrifices and giving service to the Lord that the Lord is not accepting because you're full of hypocrisy and extortion and corruption. The harlots then who repent and the publicans who repent, they go into the kingdom of God before you. It says, and when he told them that, look at verse 32. In verse 32, for John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. Religious people, if they do not believe, they'll perish. Whatever the religion, Christianity, or the other religion, or that other religion, anyone, in any religion, um, you know, I'm doing good work, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. If they don't repent, they will perish. And so Jesus said, John the Baptist came and he preached the word. And you religious people, you did not believe, you did not repent. But the publicans and the harlots believed him believed him when he said repent they believed when he said the axe is laid to the root of the tree and every tree that does not bring forth good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire everlasting fire they believed and because they didn't want to go into everlasting fire they repented and believed and they were saved it's not only rehab the harlot other harlots who repent, other harlots who believe, they are also saved. And he said, when ye had seen it, you repented not. And then it says, and to watch that ye might believe him. It's uh, showing very clearly that whosoever will turn away from sin and believe on the Lord, will be saved, will be forgiven, and his life will be turned around. We're looking at Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. In Second Peter chapter 3, reading from verse 9, it said, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, all of us. Why? Because he's waiting for everyone to repent, not willing that any shall perish, but that all shall come to repentance. There's no salvation without repentance. Just joining a church, there's no salvation there. Joining our church, there's no salvation there. Learning how they dress, how they look, how they talk, and doing copycat, copying the external behavior. That doesn't reach the heart. There's no salvation there. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all, all, all shall come to repentance we're looking at number two number two we're looking at recovered humans separated by justification from filthiness it doesn't want anyone to remain in the fields of sin in the fields of the flesh in the work of the flesh. He calls on anyone that wants to belong to the kingdom of God. He calls on everyone that wants to abide with him forever. That you are cleansed from that filthiness. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 
reading here from verse 1. Having therefore these promises that they belong, the promise of forgiveness, we have that promise, the promise of freedom, freedom from every yoke of the past, and coming into the freedom of the children of God. We have that promise. The promise of a new heart. I will take away the stony heart and give you the heart of flesh. Promise. The promise of the Spirit. I'll pour my Spirit upon you so that you can do my will. Promise. The promise of God, as many as received him, to them he gave power, he gave the privilege, he gave the right to become the sons of God. Even the people that believed in his name, having all these promises that they beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness, all filthiness of the flesh. We must be free from them. If any form of filthiness of the flesh is still in our lives, we're not ready for heaven. We must be cleansed. We must be free from all the filthiness of the flesh. Filthiness of language. Filthiness of sinity. But corruption abominable language pornography part of the filthiness and if we're going to see the lord on the final day having all these promises let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of god look at verse 10 in verse 10 it says, For godly sorrow walketh repentance to salvation. Godly sorrow. You're so ashamed of your past life. And every time you remember, you're sorrowful. How could I have done that? How could I have gone in to that private place to have done the dirty, defiling, filthy thing. You are ashamed and you are sorrowful. And you come before the Lord. You say, Lord, uh, what kind of ignorance I manifested. And you were religious even at that time. It says now, Godless sorrow walketh repentance to salvation, not to be regretted of, repented of, but... The sorrow of the world walketh dead. For the sorrow of the world, the fellow has done that dirty, foolish, defiling thing. And he never knew he'll be caught. He's caught. She never knew it will come to the open. She is caught. And now the shame brings sorrow. The shame brings anxiety. I don't know what will happen after this has come to the light. That's the sorrow of the world. But before you um, get into that shame, sorrowful, shameful, sorrowful thing, have the sorrow, the godly sorrow that leads you to repentance, and then you have the salvation of the Lord. James chapter 1. We're reading from verse 21. James chapter 1, verse 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness. If you are born again, lay apart all filthiness. If you profess to know the Lord and the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed you, has washed you, and you don't have any delight anymore in all those filthy things of the flesh wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Uh, being naughty is being stubborn. Being naughty is continuing in what you know to be wrong 
and you do that with bold face, and you do that with a stiff neck, and you do that with a hardened heart. It says, if you claim to belong to the Lord, lay apart all the superfluity of naughtiness with meekness. Now you receive the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Ezekiel chapter 36, what are you reading from verse 25? Ezekiel 36, verse 25. Then will I sprinkle wa clean water upon you. This is God talking. There's not a prophet going to sprinkle water on you. It's not, um, you know, those uh, pray for me prophets that is taking you to the riverside. What a foolish art. Now the man calling himself a prophet will take you to the riverside and wash whatever deception they put into your life. But this is God himself saying, I will sprinkle clean water upon you. And ye shall be clean when God sprinkles that heavenly water spiritual water inspired words in our heart will be clean if you're not clean and if you cannot shake off the uncleanness the filthiness out of your life out of your thoughts out of your lifestyle it means the lord has not sprinkled that heavenly water upon you don't lie against the Lord. The Lord has saved me, but as say continue in that sin, I said he saved me from. That's lying against the Lord. The Lord has cleansed me, and I'm still filthy. That's lying against the Lord. The Lord has taken away all the works of the flesh. And your thoughts and your mind and your action and your lifestyle still shows all that all the works of the flesh that's lying against the Lord. When the Lord actually cleanses you, you're clean. He says, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, all, all, all your filthiness, and from all your all your idols will I cleanse you. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, a new heart also will I give you. Understand, out of the heart are the issues of life. If you have a new heart, truly, your life will be new. Your thoughts will be new. Your character will be new. Your utterances will be new. Your temper will be new. But, you know, if we still have that angry temper, boisterous temper, hateful temper, hypocritical temper, and we still have that self-centered temper, don't lie against the Lord. If you have a new heart, your life, your thoughts, your disposition, everything will be new. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit, having a new attitude, having a new uh, disposition, a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart. It says, you're not going to have the truth. If the stony heart is there, the soft, fleshly heart is not there. The Lord is going to take away the stony heart before he brings in the soft, meek, lowly, humble, fleshly heart. You cannot say, well, I know I have the stony heart. I also have the fleshly heart. No. He said he will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Amen? Amen. He will do it. Amen. He must do it. Amen. 
If he doesn't do it, you'll miss heaven forever and ever, and you'll cry. If he doesn't take away that stiff neck, that stubbornness, that disobedience, that stony heart, and that superfluity of naughtiness. If you die with such a stony heart, rebellious against the word of God, sinning with impunity, and you die in that condition, I don't care who comes to conduct the burial. A bishop, an overseer, a general, superintendent, whatever, all that, you've gone, you've gone. And where the tree falls, that is where the tree will remain. And the people of the world and the people in the church all may be saying, it's gone to glory, not with a stubborn, rebellious, stony, disobedient heart. He must do it. We must allow him to take away that stony heart and give us the heart of flesh. Verse 27, in verse 27, and I will put my spirit, not Satan's spirit, not our parents' spirit, not our leader's spirit. You know, there's transfer of spirit. I see the leader, I see the preacher, he gets angry. He must slaps the members of the church. And that spirit transfers to the members of the church. It just comes naturally to them. Our pastor does that, I do that too. Our father in the Lord does that, I do that too. Our mommy in the Lord does that. I do that to you. Transference of spirit, not the transfer of the spirit coming from man, even a religious man. But it says, I will put my spirit within you. When Christ puts his spirit within us, it's a gentle spirit, it's a lowly spirit, it's a meek spirit, it's an honest spirit that doesn't change anything to deceive anyone. It says, I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Amen. We're looking at number three here. Number three, we're looking at the reprobate hypocrites who will suffer judgment for their falsehood. Uh, there are people who are, you know, hypocrites and they really don't have um, any clean life to back up the profession of the conversion they say they have. And in James chapter 2, reading from verse 20, it tells us in verse 20, James chapter 2, reading there from verse 20, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works, faith without corresponding action, Faith without the fruit. Faith without the outcome of true faith. Would you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Look at verse 26. In verse 26, it says, But at the body without the spirit is dead. So faith without works, faith without corresponding action, faith without practical positive fruit is dead also. And that faith does not save anyone. All those people who have dead faith, they are regarded as reprobates. And reprobates do not stay, do not abide, 
in the kingdom of God. Titus chapter 1, we're reading from verse 16. Titus chapter 1, verse 16. They profess that they know him. They profess their children of God. They profess that they are converts to Christ. They profess that they are born again. They profess that they know God. But in works deny him. Understand this epistle of Paul to Titus. And he's saying the same thing that after you say you believe, after you say you put your faith in Christ, there should be a change, a transformation. If the transformation is not there, Paul is telling us by the inspiration of the Spirit, they profess that they know him, they know God, but in works they deny him, in action they deny him, by disobedience they deny him by ungodliness, unrighteousness. They deny him being abominable. They do abominable things. They dress in abominable ways. They talk abomina abominable things. And they do the things of the flesh that are abominable to the Christian, to Christ. And to the God of heaven, being abominable and unto every good work reprobate. And such people cannot, will not get to heaven. Now, if all hypocrites get to heaven, if sinners get to heaven, if incorrigible people get to heaven, heaven will be like the world here. Why are we eager to go to heaven? Why do we want to go to heaven if that, say, if that heaven will be like, you know, the earth here with hypocrites and liars and abominable people and unrighteous people? No, they cannot because it says follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three is enduring consecration and permanent characteristics of resilient faith resilient faith when the storms come you keep standing you're steadfast you're resilient when uh, temptations come trials come and when people do things against you that should push you down that should make you give up, that should make you say, it looks like this way, this road of holiness is tough. When they think that everything, they push and pull and drag and beat and all that, and you still keep on standing on that same scriptural, biblical conviction, that's resilience. You have resilient faith enduring consecration and permanent characteristics of resilient faith. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 31, it says, by faith the harlot Rahab perished not. Understand? Obedient faith, resilient faith, regenerating of faith, righteous faith not that i believe in god i believe in god and she remained an harlot never i believe in god i believe in god and she's in unity in fellowship with the pagans in jericho no she believed in god and that faith in god brought her out of that relationship of that integration of the unbelievers by faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not she suffered relationship from the people that believed not 
and and he seen they were doing together anywhere they were going together now she believed the lord and here was where she stood and all the other people that did not believe they are going to carry weapons of warfare against the people of god she said no, i'm not going to be part of them that is the kind of faith that shows were real real children of god she perished not of the people that believed not and then were told when she received she had received the spies with peace received the spies with peace the canaanites and the people in jericho did not receive accept the spies with peace they said where have they gone will pursue them will destroy them a kind of violent spirit that will not receive the messengers of peace with peace that shows those people on the other side but Rahab distinguished herself Rahab stood her ground and received them with peace because of her faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the expectant faith. Despite the, con the condemnation of the people, Number two is the expected faithfulness and deep and dependence on the condition of promise. Number three is the expanding fruitfulness by devotion to the covenant of peace. Look at number one. Number one, the expectant faith. The faith that was expecting despite the condemnation of her people. We're told in Joshua chapter 2, reading from verse 8. Joshua chapter 2, verse 8. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. Please uh, understand here. She accommodated the spies, men, two men. And she had been an abominable, notorious harlot. And she didn't offer her body to them. Although she knew that's useless now. I can't go that direction anymore because destruction is coming. And this is what the Lord has seen. The corruption not only of Rahab, of all the people of Canaan. And God said, that's why the land is spewing them out. That's why the Lord is going to destroy them. And she knew that. And now for her to now come and offer a harlot trade, to them that would be abomination she would she would have perished the point is whatever your past has been if you come to the lord that past must drastically change the grace of god does that the faith in christ does that if her lord rehab still continued and came to them upon the roof and offered to them what she had been offering other men. She would show she didn't really have the conviction that leads to conversion. If you in your life, if your past life of immorality, your past life of adultery, your past life of fornication, your past life of disobedience, your past life of rebellion, your past life of smoking, your past life of drunkenness. If it still continues, if Christ comes, you will perish. So 
when somebody is really converted and born again, the old lifestyle does not continue. And so we're told she came to them on the roof. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, verse 9, she said, and she said unto them, unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror, your fear is falling upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. Verse 10. In verse 10, it says, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for, for you. When ye came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side, Jordan, Sion, Sion and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, and as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God. Not that he was when you crossed the Red Sea, not that he will be maybe later in your history. He is at this time and every time, every day, every moment in every generation. He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. This is what she believed and this is what she expressed. And Hebrews 11 tells us it's by faith. He said that and believed that. He was now expecting that he'll be saved as he gets into covenant relationship with the God of Israel represented by these two spies. Look at number two. Number two, expected faithfulness and dependence on the condition of promise. Already we've read uh, part of that story. They said, this scarlet cord that you are letting us down by, put it there as a sign that you have identified yourself as a candidate for salvation. Let it remain there permanently. And then yourself, your father, your mother, your brothers, your sisters, let them come in and stay there under the cover of this scarlet thread. If anyone goes out, he will die. His blood will be upon him. But all those who remain and abide under the mark of the blood of the Lamb, his blood will be upon us. If anything touches him, he agrees with that condition of promise. We're looking at Joshua chapter 2 verse 14. In Joshua chapter 2, reading from verse 14, it tells us, And the men answered her, Our life for yours, if ye utter our life for yours, if ye utter not this our business, and if and it shall be, when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly, honestly with the covenant terms and truly with thee. Verse 15. In verse 15, then she let them down 
by a coach through the window. For her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. Look at verse 16 there. Uh, sorry, verse 17. In verse 17, and the man said unto her, We will be blameless of this thine oath, which thou hast made us swear. Then in verse 18, Behold, when we come, Unto the land thou shalt bind this line of scarlet, of scarlet thread in the window which thou didst let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father, thy mother, thy, and thy brethren, and all thy father's household home unto thee. In verse 19, And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house unto the street, his blood shall be upon his head and we will be guiltless and whosoever shall be with thee in the house his blood shall be on our head if any hand be upon him look at verse 20 there in verse 20 it says and if thou utter this our business, then we will be quit of thine oath, which thou hast made us to swear. Verse 21. In verse 21, and she said, according unto your word, so be it. Look at that. She didn't say, no, I don't accept that condition. I don't accept those terms. Let me give you my own opinion. When you come to the kingdom of God, what the Lord has laid down, the terms and the condition of remaining in the kingdom, abiding in the kingdom, that's the condition you stay by. You don't push the doctrine of the Bible aside. Put all the conditions of security aside and then bring your own condition i believed on the lord forever and forever i am saved even if i go back to sin even if i backslide i am still saved no you don't bring your own condition she said according unto your words so be it and she sent them away and they departed and she bound immediately she bound the scarlet line on in the window that's the condition and we're going to abide by the condition of the lord in jesus name when i say the blood i will pass over you but if you come out of under the security of the blood of the lamb the salvation will not remain we're coming to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. Hebrews 10, verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. We believed and we came into life eternal by faith. We continue in that same faith in Christ so that as we are justified, the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Verse 39. In verse 39, but we're not of them who draw back carelessly, who draw back deliberately, who draw back 
erroneously, who draw back because of false doctrine, because of false idea, I am special. Even if I draw back, I'm still all right. Even if I continue in secret sin, I will still get to heaven. They draw back because of self-deception. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But were not of them who draw back unto perdition. Amen? Amen. But of them that believe unto the saving of the soul. We're coming to number three now. Number three is the expanding fruitfulness by devotion to the covenant of peace. What she did eventually when they came, when the Israelites came and the Jericho walls fell down, she was in the place where the spies left her. She remained in the place where the spies left her. And the scarlet court was there. And the father, the mother, the brothers, the sisters, all they had, they were all inside. The Lord, after saving us, brings us into the kingdom. He wants us to remain. He wants us to abide where he has put us. And not stray away and not go away from the cover from the wings under the wings of the shadow of the Almighty. He wants us to abide that there lies our refuge. I pray we will not leave the place where the Lord has put us in Jesus' name. It tells us in Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37, we're reading from verse 26. Ezekiel 37. 26. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. The Lord wants us to abide in peace. My peace I give unto you, not as the world give it, but I give my peace unto you. And then the God of peace sanctifies us wholly. Body, spirit, soul, and spirit. Because he is faithful and what he has promised he will do. And as we abide in that peace, perfect peace, he makes our heart to abide and remain with him. And when the pre peace, the prince of peace shall come, because he's the only one that can bring peace on earth. While he's away now, there's no peace. And he even said, don't you think I come to bring peace? I come to bring division between those who believe in the family and those who do not believe. But when he comes, then it brings that peace. There'll be a reign of a thousand years in the perfect peace of the Lord. And then after that, we'll continue in heaven, in peace forever and ever and ever in Jesus' name. I will be there. I will be there. If after being saved, you're sanctified and you follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Let's bring everything we've heard, everything we've learned unto the Lord in prayer. He saves. His grace saves. Our faith in Him saves. Are you saved? Rahab the harlot was saved, but she did not continue in that fleshly, adulterous, fornicating lifestyle after that salvation. 
Are you saved? Do you believe the judgment of God coming? She believed. She knew judgment was coming on our country, on our community. She had that conviction. That's what brought the faith. She made the confession in deep faith. Do you really have conviction that judgment is coming? Do you have conviction that the only way to escape is to truly, consciously, honestly, transparently repent and believe that there's no salvation in any other but only in Christ, our Savior, the final sacrifice, the acceptable sacrifice unto the Father. Faith that does not look in any other direction for salvation. Rahab did not look in any other direction. Her people had their tradition. She didn't look direction the direction of tradition. As a professional harlot, she knew how to catch men. She had gathered some experience in luring men into that kind of abominable behavior. But when those spies came, and she knew. This is my chance for salvation. She was cleansed of all that carnal, fleshly wisdom and didn't propose anything to those men. She was clear, caught, saved, really converted really transformed is your salvation like that are you saved clear clean undebatable or are you on the borderline swaying here and there and if the wind of temptation is too strong, you fall into the ditch. Make your way right with God. When you confess, you confess with the purpose of forsaking. Forsaking totally, fully, completely. No shade or shadow or appearance of the abominable past. She's separated from her countrymen. She dropped loyalty to her pagan country. Now she was going to be loyal to the God of heaven and earth. And there was no doubt about her face. 
about her conversion. Eventually, she was brought in into the fellowship of the family of Israel and even got married. If she had been of double character, living like her past life of abominable filthiness, and then sometimes behaving like an Israelite, <clears throat> if she had been of double character, she would not have been married in Israel. To the point she became an ancestress of Jesus Christ in the lineage of the people through who Jesus came into the world. That shows very clearly a conversion. Is your conversion so clear? Have you dropped the superfluity of naughtiness, the stubbornness, the stony heart? Has that been taken away? Has the God of heaven sprinkled that clean water upon you? And you free, clean. As white as snow, whiter than snow. A unique creature in Christ. Does the Spirit of God, who knows all secrets, does it bear witness with your heart? You're saved. You're clean. You're white. You're white and snow. No hidden secret sin. You stand by conviction. You live above reproach. Are you at peace in your heart? Are you holy in your heart? Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Think about eternity. Think about escaping the judgment that will come upon all people that remain in their sins. As you go back home, continue in prayer. Be sure beyond any shadow of doubt that all sins, filthiness, superfluity of naughtiness, stony heart, stubborn behavior, stiff neck, be sure, beyond any shadow of doubt, everything is cleansed away from your life. Waiting, ready for the coming of the Lord.
Uh, Father, we thank you for the exposure and the exposition of your word. We pray, Lord, you write your word on the tables of our hearts in Jesus' name. We're asking you to show mercy, your manifest grace, and you grant us this gift of real, practical, life-changing, heart-transforming faith that our lives will not remain the way we were in the past in Jesus' name. That you granted Rahab true conversion, genuine conversion, real regeneration. Lord, we pray our experiences in Christ for conversion, for salvation, for righteousness will be real beyond any shadow of doubt in Jesus' name. And we'll pray, Lord, as you bring us and place us in your kingdom, the grace to continue in your grace, the faith to continue in, your, in the faith, grant to everyone in Jesus' name. You have told us already that because iniquity shall abound, the love of many, but not of all, the love of many will wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Help us to endure unto the end. Times of temptation, times of trial, we will not fall in Jesus' name. We pray that the old habit, the old temper, the old disposition, the old anger, the old filthiness will not come back into our lives anymore in Jesus' name. You have cleansed us, help us to remain clean. You purified us, help us to remain pure. Help us to be always expecting the coming of the Lord and to be ready anytime the Lord will come. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.
by your spirit. In Jesus' name, I pray. In Psalm 100, verse 4, enter into his gate with thanksgiving and into his court with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. We want to go before the Lord tonight and thank the Lord. We want to thank God this night for his faithfulness and for the great opportunity to gather at his feet.